If you're in Genesis 37, and you remember when I was in here, we went through the life of Jacob and Esau before I opened up our children's classes. I think I mentioned, perhaps I did it, but I think I mentioned Joseph uh, was one of Jacob's sons, and ultimately he was Jacob's favorite son, and he had this coat of many colors that his father's made him. Anyway, uh, I think I had mentioned some of that stuff, but if not, you can go back and read it and read it, and I think everybody here knows that story anyways. But if you remember, Jacob was, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph was taken by his brothers, and then he was thrown into a pit. Their plan ultimately was to kill him. But they ended up not killing him because Reuben talked them out of killing him. So their plan was uh, they would sell him. Reuben wasn't around evidently when they made the plan. I guess something I want to read you off of that. Reuben evidently wasn't around when they made that plan. He was out doing whatever he was supposed to be doing. And um, But when he comes back, look at chapter 37 and verse 29. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, J J uh, Joseph was not in the pit. So he was gone. They take Joseph out, they sell him, and he rent his clothes. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? Now, Reuben probably could not bear the thought of facing his father without Joseph. That's going to break Jacob's heart. He was his favorite son. And he didn't want to tell Dad that they'd been mean and cruel enough to sell Joseph as a slave, so that wasn't really going to be much of an option. So somebody comes up with a plan. You remember the plan? A way out. We'll just tell Jacob a lie. So that was their plan. And uh, he's got to be told a lie, and anytime we have to tell a lie, you know that's a bad plan, right? But that was their plan. So tell Dad that Joseph has been killed by some wild beast. So you go down to verse 31 and it says, And they took Joseph's coat and killed the kid of the goats and dipped it in the coat of the blood. And they sent a coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Uh, know not whether it be thy son's coat or no. Well, of course they knew that it was. And he knew it, and his day, of course he did. And said, It is my son's coat, and evil beasts have devoured him. And so Joseph, with his doubt, rent in pieces. Now that was a lie. Uh, it made it look like Joseph had been killed by this wild animal, and to make that look like that happened, they took Joseph's coat and dipped the blood of the animal all in it, took it back to, to Jacob and said, look what we found, is this by chance Joseph's coat, and by chance his dad's like, oh yeah, that's his coat. They knew it, he knew it, they knew it. And Jacob said in verse 33, let me read it again, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat. Now follow a little further in verse 34. Jacob on his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his sons many days. And all his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted in him. And he said, For I will go down to the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. What a, what a tragic story that is. How these brothers could have tried to comfort their poor father without much telling him the truth, I do not know. Verse 35 says they did. But they didn't come out and tell a flat out lie, but they did deceive their dad. And we know this from our study a couple of weeks ago that that's just the same thing as telling a lie. So that was like a little bit of review of some of the things I think we covered. But what about Joseph? Sad, weary, homesick. He's on his way to Egypt. He's 17 years old, and he's sold as a slave. He's hurt. His dad is hurt, obviously, because deceit hurts a lot of people, but that's what they did. He's probably thinking, Joseph, that is, he's probably thinking, why did they do this? Can you imagine your brothers doing that to you? So he's probably had to think, why in the world did they do this? Why has all this evil come upon me? Why this? Why me? Why not? Why are my brothers so cruel and so mean? Why had they let him be taken away by these strangers? Probably when he got there, he might have thought, how come nobody's come looking for me yet? He didn't know his brother's plan to kill an animal and soak the coat of blood and show it to Jacob. So they all think he's dead, but he didn't really know that. 
Now the first night comes. He's all alone. He's feeling lonely. And I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure, pretty confident he's probably thinking about home and all of his dad, probably his little brother Benjamin. Now I want you to think with me on something. His mother died when she gave birth to Benjamin. At 17 years old, his brothers hate him. They throw him in a pit. They have planned to kill him. They sell him into slavery. He's taking out. And I just want to ask you a question. Are those traumatic events in the life of somebody? Those are traumatic events. And I'm, going to, I'm headed somewhere with this. You and I, we always face some kind of traumatic event from time to time through our life. Everybody does. It's part of living. But if you study the rest of Joseph's life, and we are with the young people in there, Joseph always handled these traumatic events the proper way. So he's on his way to Egypt. Joseph no doubt turned to God. It's also true that God was watching over Joseph in this trial. Because you can be sure of this, God is always with us even in our trials. Remember what he said, that the author of Hebrews said, uh, he will never leave us nor forsake us. But in his providence, this sad journey into slavery, this is, this, you would have not seen this except we have hindsight, which is 2020, was the best thing that could have happened to Joseph. But I can promise you when this was going on in his life right at this time, he's not saying, boy, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. That's not what he's thinking. But this is going to turn out that way. And though Joseph didn't understand it at the time, God was using these events using his brother's unkindness to lead him to a great future which otherwise he would have never known. Now you've heard me say this multiple times in our church this year. That's the hidden hand of God. That's the providential hand of God at work in the life of this young man. God does that. He brings great blessings and happiness out of something that for a while seems very hard to bear. God leads his trusting children out of darkness and he leads him into light. So here comes Joseph into this country he'd never seen before, did not know one person there, not knowing what the future held, but he did know who held the future. Now, God specializes in bringing good from bad. We've just got to learn to trust God. And we've got to understand that God's hand is at work. After this, now he's in Egypt, probably know the rest of the story. Well, the Ishmaelites, they need to make a buck. So they decide they're going to sell Joseph. And they sell him to a man by the name of Potiphar. And he ends up in Potiphar's house. And everywhere Joseph went, he always had a good spirit, he had a good mannerism, everybody liked him, everybody was drawn to him. And so as, as the time went on, a little bit of time goes on, in Potiphar's house, Potiphar trusting him more and trusting him more, and pretty much just lets Joseph move into his house almost and says, you know, you take care of everything that needs to be taken care of. Well, it's not long. He's lied about by Potiphar's wife, and she tries to have an immoral relationship with him, which he would have nothing of that was just part of him. But now, he's lied about Potiphar believes his wife, and that's what he's going to do, most likely. Most people would do that. And he ends up two years in prison. And he was an innocent person. That is just another traumatic event in his life. Because they come. Now, I want to mention some things. Listen. His mother dies. His brothers hate him. They decide to kill him. But instead, they sell him into slavery. He's taken from his home. He's taken from his dad. He's sold into slavery. He's lied about. He's put into prison. And you would think, wow, that is a lot for a 17-year-old boy to have to deal with. When Tony Saxton was here, and I love Tony Saxton, and I appreciated his message, and a lot of people did but he said something in his message 
that happened to him, and I've had to think about it. He said, some of you probably remember this, he said, my mom died when I was three. And then he was put into foster care, and he went from different foster care homes, and all these. And basically, you could say that Tony had a lot of traumatical events in his life. And he said that probably contributed to his, he has depression, he talked up and down. Maybe it did. But, you know what? Nobody here is a victim. You do not have to allow the events in your life to defeat you. All of us have faced traumatic events in our life. And if you haven't, trust me on something, you will. Because they're part of life. You live in a fallen, cursed world. There was another man that used to go here uh, to church. He's passed away now. He's in heaven. But uh, he died young of cancer. Was Pat Sandy 50? Uh, just about. I mean, he was young. And now that you're on the other side of 50, it's like, well, that's, that's really young. But anyway, uh, Pat was almost the same story. He was in foster homes. I don't know what happened, why. I, I'm sure he told me, but I forgot. He ended up in foster home, foster home, foster home, foster home. He never really struggled with a lot of that stuff. Like, that. In fact, he was the dead opposite. Man, he was full of energy and bubbly and not just to go all the time. He was dead. As many of you know, bad, never bad. But all I'm trying to say is, you cannot allow... So Joseph, if, would you agree with me that Joseph had a lot of traumatic events happen in his life? Did he allow those to destroy his life? No. He, even in prison, he made friends with the guard, he made friends with the prisoners, the butler and the baker especially, and he, he was even put in church. He always had a good attitude. So, and what I'm trying to tell you in me tonight is this, that no matter what the tyrannical experiences of our life are, we can still have a good attitude. I cannot control my circumstances. Brittany, that baby looks like it's got a mohawk from here. I gotta tell you. <laughs> it does. I probably shouldn't have said that. Man, she really does. Anyway, uh, I cannot control my circumstances in life. But I can control my attitude in all of my except I can't control things when I see it. But I can control my attitude in all of my circumstances. And so can you. You can't walk around, woe is me, woe is this, woe is that, I got the worst boss in the world, maybe. But you don't have to be the worst employee in the world. I got the worst teachers in the world. Well, maybe, but you don't have to walk around and say, oh, woe, well, you know, that's not true. Listen, make whatever happens, whatever tragedy comes into your life, Whatever trauma comes into your life, all I want to say is this. You need to walk in victory in Jesus. Jesus Paul said, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Don't allow your past to ruin your future. Now fast forward to Joseph's life. In fact, fast forward in your Bible to chapter 50. And there's a lot of, about Joseph between where we were and to where we get to here. Verse 20. Yep, that's right. His brothers find out that Joseph is a, like second in command to Pharaoh. And they go there to get food. And they're like, oh man, this is not good. But in verse 20, Joseph said this, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. The circumstances, Joseph said, don't worry about them. God had a purpose. God had a plan. God had everything in control. He knew what he was doing. And you've just got to trust the Lord. 
You've got to believe that God is working in your life, and I have to believe that God is working my life to bring about His purpose, His plan, His ultimate will. God is working. How many of you, probably most everybody in here, how many of you have seen the movie God's Not Dead? Okay, that's quite a few. I, I do want to say something. God isn't dead. We have to trust God. Even in the traumatical events. I don't, I, I, I would, how do I say this nicely? Don't allow the traumatical events in your life and don't use those for a crunch. Well, this is what happened to me. Yeah, but let me ask you this, and then I'm going to pray. Did your brothers or sister ever sell you into slavery? Anybody have that? Did they throw you into pit and say, hey, let's make some money off of this deal? Did they have, were you ever lied about and ended up in prison for two years if you did? Don't raise your hand on that, okay. But uh, you probably, if you ended up in prison, it's probably because you did something you shouldn't have done. But that wasn't the case with Joseph. But here he is, loses his mom when he's just a young, young boy. But God raised him up and he always had a good attitude. So let's have a look at it. Father, I pray that you, you know, traumatic events happen in all of our lives. They just do. It's part of living in a fallen person. One day, one day there'll be no traumatic events happen in our lives. All things will be made new to what the Word teaches us. But this evening, help all of us to realize that the things that happen, good, bad, and otherwise, we can always have a good spirit about us, a good attitude about us, in Jesus' name. Amen.